The DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry, presents the Cavalcade of America. Tonight's star, Dennis O'Keefe. Tonight's play, The Saga of Jerry O'Brien, the story of the first American victory at sea. <laughs> Jeremiah O'Brien, one of the early American O'Briens, a famous clan down east in Maine. As everyone knows, the O'Briens were kings in Ireland long before London town could boast a tower. As to how we came to the province of Maine, well, tyranny and famine thought of that long, long ago. Which is the story of the O'Brien's finest hour. And it begins and ends, as all good stories should, with a pretty girl. The time, an evening in the early spring of 1775. The girl, well, <laughs> I'll let her speak for herself. She would, indeed. The answer, Jerry O'Brien, is still no. I- I'll not be your wife. I'd not be your wife if your father owned all the sawmills between Boston and Quebec. Oh, so it'd do no harm to ask again. How many times have I asked you now? Do you think I keep town? No, oh, I do indeed. If only to boast of it to those blue-nosed Yankee crones that hem you around. Oh, I've told the story to no one, Jerry. Not even to my sister. Well, you're very ashamed of me, then? Oh, no, that's ridiculous. If, if I marry you, I'll be scratching here in the wilderness for all my life, and that's not what I want. Oh, what do you want? Surely no man in the child for all of men to give you more the O'Brien's rule here, for we only, only trade for a hundred miles. And I'll not marry a sawmill. Not even if it's the only sawmill. Oh, Jerry, I... Well, I'm, I'm sick to death of trees. I want to get out of here. I want to see the great world. Boston, New York, London even. Well, London, is it? In Boston, I could manage. Perhaps once in a year when the work is flat. As a matter of fact, my brother rides there now in business for the mill, but London... You in London? Why not? Oh, Peg, I don't know. It's all beyond me. I'm not a big enough man for the likes of you, and that's the heart of it. I have my own dreams, yes, but well, they're not so grand as yours. Oh, make them grand, Jeremiah, you can do it. You think so now? Oh, I know it, Jerry. Why, you're the smartest man in the child, and the strongest, too. Oh, well, strong I am. But smart, I sometimes doubt. Oh, yes. No, I've no head at all for figures. <laughs> Money slips through my fingers like water through a sieve. If it's a smart man you watch, my brother Gideon's the one for you. Gideon? With his fancy words and his superior ways of saying two things at once, no thanks. Well, he'd get you to London, girl, if anyone can. Mm. All your brand's brains went to him, such as they are. Mm, but can he work at the logging all day long and then dance the whole night through and... And work again in the morning? The dancing, yes. <laughs> the work and no. Well, there you are. Yes, well, I am, my dear. Now you have me fair confused. As it looks to me, there's two things you want, and no man can give you both. Oh, someone's coming, Jerry. We mustn't be seen. Oh, well, stay quiet now, Peg. I'm tired of all this hiding. Jerry! Well, just Gideon himself, I'm only from Boston. I told him all about us, Peg. Well, Jerry and Peg... Ah, the bands to be published then. Can I offer my congratulations? Oh, don't be silly, man. Why will the great Lavalin hurry you? Are you so desperately wishing to be home? Uh, I am that. Oh, this is a new thing, then. I bring news, brother. Great news. Earth-shaking news. The price of lumber, is that? Uh, that may well be, but lumber's not in it. It's a matter of state. Well, tell me, then. Not now. The news that all the O'Briens must hear. And we must hear it first before the town itself is torn apart. Uh, you'll excuse us, then, Peggy, because... Uh, Peggy... Peggy, where are you? Your little pigeon has flown away, brother. What a beauty. <laughs> you are a lucky devil. Yeah, I know. That's all you know about it. Now, what's this great news? It must wait. It calls for a family council. Old Morris must get his teeth into it first. Come along now. This is more important than pretty Peggy Bates. This is the biggest thing that's happened since St. Patrick himself set foot in Galway. I don't believe you, Gideon. You will, brother. You will. <laughs> We 
must be there my father, old Morris O'Brien, who came to the cold wilderness from Ireland and fought it and tamed it and made it yield bread for his sons and their mothers. The news that Gideon brought was important, and my father knew just how important it was. On that night, when the O'Briens had offered up family prayer. Amen. And Joseph, I'll thank you now to mumble. Lift up your voice, boy, in the praise of God. See what your voice is for. Yes, sir. Now, <clears throat> now, taking into consideration the importance of the occasion, I'll call a meeting. A meeting of the O'Brien men. Oh, will you not call me to counsel as well, Morris O'Brien? This is a matter for the men, Mary, and only for the men. A matter for men, is it? When they're killing it. Oh, I knew. I knew when Gideon come riding home with a face all aflame. Mary, this is purely a thing for the sighting by men. All the men I see are my own sons and my husband. Must I sit to the window again and wonder if my sons are alive or dead? What I did for my husband in the old days? It may be. It may be. It may be that it must be. Oh, it can't be. Not here in this new land, where we've found peace at last and plenty and no killing. I've done with killing. Oh, there, there, now, Mother, there, there. I'm afraid the killing swallowed us. It's the same old quarrel. Hey, Jeremiah, the same old quarrel. The tyrant has pursued us even here. And can he find us here in the heart of the great forest so far away? Oh, Jerry, can he find us here? Uh, he can, Mother, and he will. He can indeed, and he will. So let me state the case, Father, as, uh, uh, what? as I'm the eldest. For years now, this thing's been closing in on us, Mother. All the restrictions, all the taxes, yes. It's been a long time coming, and now it's here. You've all heard the news at a place called Lexington. Which same, I don't know where it is, nor do I care. Oh, no, does it matter, Father. At Lexington, the war's begun. Men have been killed. Men of our own kind. They've taken arms against the English king. And they've won. By heaven, they've won. So Gideon says, and I believe my brother. The question is... What are we in Maine to do? What are we to do? Have no part in this quarrel. Rest quiet. I should have got as far away and there's no concern of ours. Be still, Mary. Your brains are involved, as any fool can see. Our lumber goes to Boston by sea, and our lumber is our life. Surely the British in Boston will rule the sea. So, if we join in the revolt, they can starve us, and they will. Unless we drop to our knee and kiss my lordship's foot once again as we had to do at home. And what if we resist? They'll harry us, son. Ah, a small slip of war. They could spare such a one, no doubt, and blockade our harbor here. No lumber going out. No goods from Boston coming in. No food. Nothing to eat but what we can raise in the clearing. Ah, that's the old, old story. Perhaps it's not so serious, Father. Gideon... What do you mean? Back in Boston, as many a merchant plays both ends against the middle. There are those who collaborate with the British and do very well. There's a middle road, and many take it. Gideon, is it your thought that the O'Briens might wear two faces before the world? I said, but this many do in Boston town. And they save their skins and their money bags. Mm, I see me six sons about me. Could we do that? Could we bow and scrape on Monday, and then on Tuesday scrape and bow the other way? Could the O'Briens do that? Jeremiah. Not the O'Brien. Could we not, sir? What else shall we do? Shall we see this little hole that we've taken on a place in a sunny world go down? Shall we starve again? And take the whole town starving with us? All because of stiff necked Irish pride. Pride, is it? I pride. Nothing else. Pride. A mock of sin. And is avarice not a sin? And if we bow our necks, will it not be for greed that we do it? As between avarice and pride, by the saints, I'll rest me proud. Well, one thing is certain. The choice is ours and ours alone. As we go, so men will go for this far part of it. For all their Yankee lives depend on us and on our mill. Very well, then. I'll take a vote in the way of this new country. All those who favor that the O'Brien shall resist the British king in this new war, let them signify by saying I, as I do call their name. Jeremiah Francis O'Brien. I. Gideon Patrick O'Brien. Mm, I. Though it is not the way of the best folk in Boston. 
John Ignatius O'Brien. Aye. William Vincent O'Brien. Aye. Dennis Franklin O'Brien. Aye. Joseph Adams O'Brien. Gosh, yes. <coughs> oh, all right, then. If I must, I must. Uh, Mary Margaret Fogarty O'Brien. Aye. And when your prideful heads are all broken and sore, come back to your mother. <laughs> and I'll mend them if I can. <laughs> Brian's is made by unanimous vote, declared war upon his Britannic Majesty, George III. And after a week of chewing on the news from Lexington, the citizens of Machias saw a British armed cutter, the Margareta, on the horizon of their bay. And soon the drums of the British Marines rolled through the one street in my little town. <laughs> For His Excellency, Lieutenant James Moore of the Royal Navy. Pay attention for His Majesty's officer, Lieutenant James Moore. Hello, subjects of His Majesty. Hello, Englishman. You've had news of certain treasonable actions in the vicinity of Boston. Silence. The vessel I command has a gun trained upon your town at this moment. I bring with me a communication from General Gage, commanding all British troops in these provinces. That message will be read to you by Captain Ichabod Jones, your fellow citizen, whose lumber troops, Unity and Polly, carry the produce of this town to Boston. Captain Jones. Confound it, I told you not to get me up here in front of everybody. Read the proclamation, Captain Jones. Yeah, yeah, I suppose I must. Well, then, it goes like this. To his majesty's subject at Machias in the province of Maine, be it known that the forces of his majesty have the greatest need of lumber for the building of winter quarters and for use in the fortification of Boston against those traitors lately joined in rebellion against the crown. Hey, it's this turn, I told you. Go on, go on, Captain Jones. Now listen here, you. Listen here. I've got to read this thing. And what it says is, either you ship lumber to Boston on my sloops, or else you get no food from Boston. It's lumber for Gage and the British, or Machias starves. And I don't care what you do. For it's not my doing, and I'm going to get down out of here. Captain Jones, read that proclamation. Thank you, for will. They know what it says. Let them take it along with it. Hard up! The drop! The drop, man! Down the road! Which way will it go? Well, who knows? Half the town wants to give in, half wants to fight. There's no one to tell them what to do. My father has done his best. He's been talking all day till his voice itself has gone with the wind. Your father is an old man. He talks in a way strange to most of us. We need a younger voice. Mine, Peggy? Yours. My love. Uh, You've never called me that before. No, and I'll never call you that again. Unless you act. Oh, but what can be done? The Margaretta's guns command the town. And Captain Jones's two lumber sloops lie at the wharf. The Polly and the Unity. Say now, we could take the two sloops and end the whole argle puzzle for a while. You could, if you had the heart for it. Oh, you do you think I've not? Well, I've wondered. Then wonder no more, my love. We'll move tonight. <laughs>
return to our cavalcade play, The Saga of Jerry O'Brien, starring Dennis O'Keefe. <laughs> committed to action after all the talk. While the British cutter lay in stupid quiet in the harbor, we took the two sloops of Ichabod Jones at the wharf. And there we were. And there was the Margareta out in the bay, broadside to the town, with four three-pounders and 14 swivel guns, all trained on the homes we built out of the wilderness. The men of Machias looked up to me and to the O'Brien clan for help. And there was only one answer. Now listen to me. Listen here. We must use the two lumber sloops to capture the Margareta. No, 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 Cannon! No, Cannon! No, Cannon! No, Cannon! Silence! Silence, you fools! You have one gunner. Long years ago, I fought at the taking of Lewisburg against the French. And Jan Will Knight has a wall gun at home. I can mount it in the unity's bow. It's small to bear the name of a cannon, but it will serve if well aimed. Oh, yes. Yeah. You heard my father speak. I say we can do it. We all have arms at home. Oh, yeah. All right. All right, my word to you is this. Go get your muskets. Go get them. Now. Fifty-two, fifty-three, fifty-four... Fifty-five. Fifty-five men here on the wall. And their lives, brother, are in your charge. Do you think I don't know that? Have you counted the muskets, Gideon? I, Captain. With twenty, counting the fouling pieces, twenty guns for fifty-five men. Uh, how many pitchforks? Thirteen, Commander. How many timber axes? Twelve fine axes, Commodore. I'll take one of those in place of a sword. And what are the powder? Powder? <laughs> Aye, ah, there's the rough, my dear Admiral. We've no powder at all to load the wall gun. No powder. And only the wall gun shot could pierce yon vessel's side. That's true. Wheaton said he had 40 pounds hidden in his cellar at home. Where is it? Joe says he clean forgot it. He was in such a hurried hurry not to miss the great sea battle. He forgot it. By all the... That t- kind of war, Jerry, we're all amateurs here. Now, what was that thing? Why, it's your little pigeon, brother, I do believe. Tell me. And her sister, Joe Wheaton's wife. Jerry! Jerry, we're coming! Peggy, Peggy, what's the meaning of this? You'll not come aboard this ship. Oh, Do you see this? It is the powder. The powder my rattle brain brother in law forgot to bring. My, my sister and I have dragged this 40 pound bag all the way from Pleasant River. Oh, Peggy, <laughs> you're a darling. Oh, the war is on again. <laughs> well, you'd better get ahead with it, Admiral, or the enemy might wake up. Gideon. Are you with me or against me? Do you need to ask? I think I do. The things you say... Are my way of saying it. Would you have me pretend? This is a fool's errand we're on. And it can end only one way, in failure and death. But I'll be with you, Jerry. However it ends. Oh, I'm sorry, Gideon. This is no time for being sorry. Yonder's your navy, Admiral. Half a hundred fools. (laughs) All right, talk to them. I will. I will at that. Men, men, gather around here. Gather around and listen to me. Now, I'll take the unity out. Ben Foster will take the pally. And what Massachusetts farmers can do on land against the British, Maine lumbermen can do at sea. We're all sailors here. We've had to be. And now we'll sail against the enemies of liberty. Take your stations. happened in the next hour, I'd not wish to tell with my own lips, for I'm a modest man. Though they do say I summoned the strength of ten to my own right arm that day. But let others tell the story as is only proper. They left me ashore. Me, Morris O'Brien. Well, they said I was too old. Too old, 75. And they gave the wall gun to Will Knight to train, and him shivering in his boots a while. Ah, but sail it did against the Englishman, and I watched them. I watched the British make sail against the room. I watched the lovers mishandle in the quartering wind. So our boom swung round and snapped clean off. <laughs> Oh, 
Mrs. O'Brien. Can you see that now? The princess has lost her mantle. She's helpless. She can't move now. Can you look at her? I can see her. I can see her 18 cannons. Titan of limestone. A ram with axes and pitchforks on this. <laughs> Sort of ground. Then past the sort of ground, she's on a wood bank. But the unity goes forward. Aye, the unity goes forward alone. With my elders at the helm. Oh, I look no more. I look no more. I saw the old woman close her eyes, stumble back into the crowd, and fall in a faint. I wanted to help her, but. I could not take my eyes from the smoking harbor and the man I love. I saw the unity close in and grapple. I saw my Jerry leap aboard the enemy sloop, his great axe swinging around his head. I saw the British commander fall dead on the quarter deck. I saw his crew scramble for cover below against the flailing axes and the pitchforks of Matthias' men. And I saw my Jerry leap to the rail of the quarter deck and with one great blow of his shining axe, Cut down the British ensign and end the battle. Well, Peggy? Well, Terry? Well, well, what I mean was I thought... Uh, She's almighty quiet here in the orchard. Isn't the moonlight lovely? Oh, yes, yes. I mean, yes, yes, it is. And you do look so handsome and heroic with that bandage around your head. Oh, it's as little enough I needed for the scratch I got behind me here. I wish you'd let me take it off. After all the trouble I took to fix it just so, like like the heroes in the picture book, you'll wear it the next three days, maybe longer. If you say so, Peggy. And why must you be downcast after such a day? I'm thinking ahead, Peggy. I can't help it. Oh, but it's been a great day for the O'Briens and for all of Maine. Well, I suppose so. We've won a great battle, but we can't eat victory. We'll get nothing now from Boston, and we've got nothing here to last beyond the fall. You've got three fine sloops, Jerry. The Unity, the Polly, the Margareta. All prizes of war. Can we eat the boats then when the winter comes? No, in? but you can fill the boats with lumber and sail them to New York and bring them back chock-a-block full of flour and meat. Why, Peggy, so we could. Yes, so you could. And I'm going with you. Peggy. To settle. I've always wanted to see the great world. Oh, but Peggy, you, why, you can't. What would people say, oh, Peggy? They, they'd say not a word, not a single word. Not if we are... Well and truly married, sir. And so Peggy got what she wanted, to see the great world. For in the end, I took her to London itself. And I got what I wanted, which was to stay ever close by Peggy's side through all the days of our years. But there's more to it than that, I think. We poor folk of Machias had humbled the might of tyranny's power on the Western Ocean. We had won the new country's first victory offshore. And though we quarreled amongst ourselves, and even the O'Briens were not of one mind at all times, we drew together and fought together when the need was most great. Today, in your own time, there's an American ship of war that bears the name O'Brien in our honor. Wherever she rides, Salute her now and draw together as we did then. Dennis O'Keefe and the Cavalcade Players for tonight's story, The Saga of Jerry O'Brien.
Tonight's DuPont Cavalcade was written by George H. Faulkner and was based on the article, The O'Brien's Go to Sea, by Colonel R. Ernest Dupuy. Original music was composed by Arden Cornwell, conducted by Donald Boyd. The program was directed by John Zoller. With our star, Dennis O'Keefe, you heard Una O'Connor as Mrs. O'Brien, Jean Gillespie as Peggy, James O'Neill as Morris, Scott Cotsworth as Gideon, and Parker Fennelly as Captain Jones. Dennis O'Keefe can currently be seen starring in the Metro-Goldwyn-Mayer picture, Everything I Have is Yours. And Mr. Cy Harris reminding you to be with us next week when the DuPont Cavalcade will present Ready on the Right. Our star, Jackie Cooper. Ladies and gentlemen, for 18 years, the DuPont Cavalcade of America has brought to millions of radio listeners the true stories of our American heritage and the achievements of the men and women who gave us our American heritage. Now, the DuPont Company is bringing you Cavalcade on television. Watch the TV listings in your newspaper for Cavalcade of America TV in your locality. The DuPont Cavalcade of America came to you tonight from the Velasco Theater in New York City and is sponsored by the DuPont Company of Wilmington, Delaware, makers of better things for better living through chemistry.